Okay, in the last class, we introduced basic instrumentation workhorse for uh, acoustic measurements, that is the condenser microphone. We understand that there are many different kinds of microphone. The condenser microphone is the one that is most suited for the application of acoustic measurements. So, uh, carrying on, we also uh, sort of touched upon the idea that uh, there are two basic types of microphone, the pressure field microphone and the free field microphone. The pressure field or sometimes which is uh, a slight variant of uh, a, a diffuse field microphone also that is used in the case when sound pressure is required to be measured in a small enclosure and the diffuse field microphone as the name suggests would be more appropriate in a larger enclosure. But free field microphones are the ones typically which will be used in anechoic chambers and therein it is required that it is specially designed and for the application wherein it uh, faces only one incident wave and therefore, it is most suited for the applications where it is uh, measurements are done in an anechoic chamber which sort of simulates this anechoic environment. Okay, so, moving ahead, let us look at the technical specifications of a microphone. The microphone just like any other transducers essentially converts any the physical quantity into a voltage and that is the voltage which is measured in electrical terms. So, sensitivity is this conversion as remember acoustic pressure is primarily it is a sort of pressure which is fluctuating. So, fundamentally speaking therefore, for a unit Pascal uh, that that is uh, being uh, uh, for the amplitude of the acoustic wave being a unit Pascal, the question is how many mini volts will be generated by this sensor and that ratio the output by input ratio, the input to the sensor is the acoustic pressure amplitude wise and the output of the sensor is going to be the millivolt which is generated per unit pressure that is incident onto the microphone surface. So, this ratio will be called as sensitivity and typically this is one of the very important factor in deciding uh, or selecting a microphone because on one hand you will need a very high value of sensitivity because you do not want this value of sensitivity to be typically very low. If it is very low, if the voltage is very low then it will be embedded in the electrical noise of your measuring system and it will not be uh, properly manifested. Right? So, a higher values of voltage typically will give you what is called known as good signal quality and therefore, a higher sensitivity is what is called for in application. And also what is required is that the sensitivity should be flat across the frequency spectrum, we will come to that uh, aspect in the next this thing. The frequency response is the sensitivity factor which is the output by input of your sensor. This sensitivity factor if you try to understand if the pressure is at a particular frequency, then the voltage also will be at the same frequency because essentially the sensor works on the principle of linearity. You have to assume that the, I mean it is uh, for <coughs> it, the way the sensor is designed is it is supposed to work for linear transfer function between the voltage output and the pressure input. Right? So, the point is therefore, that if the pressure input can happen across various frequencies, which is typically the case in acoustics, you are not interested to measure just one frequency, but you are measure, uh, you are interested to measure all the frequencies that are there in the sound source that you are interested in. So, therefore, we would like this output voltage also to manifest the same characteristics in, in, in terms of voltage as it was in terms of the pressure. So, sensitivity I will just illustrate myself uh, in <coughs> notes here. So, a sensor is basically a transfer function. The input to the transfer function is the acoustic pressure amplitude and the output is the voltage. Right? But then this acoustic pressure amplitude can have can be a function of frequency omega. Right? So, the voltage also depending upon at which frequency 
the acoustic pressure amplitude is incident onto the microphone sensor, the voltage also will pick up exactly the same frequency. So, the, if the frequency of excitation is this, then the frequency of excitation uh, of the output of the sensor would be exactly this because the sensor is supposed to be linear. The transfer function relating the voltage to the acoustic input is essentially linear. So, therefore, the frequency cannot change. But now, let us say a unit 1 Pascal, I mean 1 Pascal I know is unrealistic in acoustic terms, but just for the sake of understanding the sensor, let us understand, uh, let us take this hypothetical example. Suppose 1 Pascal at this frequency, let us call this as 100 hertz, generates 1 millivolt at the same frequency of 100 hertz, right. <coughs> that is what it is. But now, let us say in the excitation, you have two frequencies, 100 hertz and the other, let us say 500 hertz. So, 500 hertz possibly has another excitation, which is double of it. So, it has two Pascals. It is imperative that the sensor reports the voltage for the 500 hertz excitation to be exactly 2 millivolts. This is, if this does not happen, if the scaling of the input is not preserved in the output, then virtually this sensor is useless in terms of measurement of multiple frequencies. It will be useful only for measurement of signals which are having a single frequency and that too you cannot compare between the two frequencies that is the, uh, that you would like to measure or something. So, virtually this sensor will be useless unless it preserves this scaling, right. So, the only way in which this scaling would be preserved is to have a frequency response function which is flat. So, the transfer function relating, let us say this is my input x in the frequency domain, the output is denoted as y in frequency domain. So, the transfer function will be y omega is equals to g omega times x of omega similar to what you ha would have done even in Laplace transform case, but since we are taking steady state, the question of Laplace transform does not arise, frequency transform is good enough, right. What we want is that this g omega function across omega should be flat. If it is anything but flat, then what I just illustrated in terms of scaling of the between the input and output will not be preserved, in which case certain frequencies will un unnecessarily be undervalued or overvalued in terms of voltage, though in terms of pressure they may have, uh, let us say you are talking about a white noise situation. So, in terms of pressure all frequencies have equal contribution, but if this g omega associated or the transfer function associated with the transducer is not flat, then you will not get a flat spectrum in the output which is the voltage corresponding to the transducer even if the input is flat, right, which means you are going to make an incorrect measurement, which means that some frequencies will be unnecessarily underestimated or overestimated depending upon how the transfer function behaves, right. So, this is something which is very important and this is what uh, we will try to look into in great detail. So, the frequency one very important attribute or a qualification of a sensor which you must never compromise on is that at least for the frequency range of your interest, you should make sure that the sensitivity chart corresponding to the microphone that you are using is showing a flat frequency response. And remember, you are not interested to have a flat frequency response from 0 hertz to uh, infinity hertz. Anyway, as you know, we hear technically it is said 20 hertz to to uh, 20 kilohertz, but possibly the range of interest in your industrial application could be a subset of that, possibly after 50 hertz only you will be interested. So, 50 hertz to maybe 15 kilohertz. So, if uh, the frequency response graph shows to be reasonably flat in this region, you should be happy with it. If you are very sure that you are looking at an application which does not generate of uh, the frequencies in the higher range or in the lower range, then appropriately you can go for another microphone also which compromises on those ranges which are not in the criteria of your measurement, but you should not compromise on the frequency, the sensitivity 
within the frequency response that you are interested that is the bottom line right and we will see how what are the restrictions what are the implications of the size of the microphone and the design of the microphone in terms of this sensitivity aspect okay and then uh, another important attribute of this sensor is that of a dynamic range so you will typically be interested to measure different range of sound pressure levels using the same microphone you should i mean you would possibly demand from the microphone supplier that it should be able to measure very feeble sound to a very loud sound but sometimes what happens is that if the if there's a loud sound associated with that there is a large voltage and you and the, uh, the sensor manufacturer usually will have some cutoff limits because he will not allow a large voltage in his circuitry because that will get spoiled. So again depending upon what is the range in which you would have an estimate depending upon your application that what is the range of SPL values that you typically would like to measure. So you should choose a microphone which allows for that range of measurement. You should not use a microphone which is meant for uh, you know uh, measurements in a recording studio of this sort in an application such as aerospace where we know that there is an intense sound that is generated. <coughs> so microphones meant for aerospace applications uh, like aero engine noise or things like that will be made with special care such that they can handle that very high intense level of noise. Okay? So dynamic range is another crucial factor. <laughs> As I said, dimensions uh, are very important. <coughs> the, uh, if typically you, uh, you, if you recall the last lecture, there we said that if you have a larger microphone, then you can expect due to the presence of the microphone, the acoustic field will be distorted and therefore the measurement will be corrupted. You would like to measure the acoustic field as it is sort of in the absence of the microphone but the just mere presence of the microphone as a solid object will create a certain boundary condition around at least the region of the microphone and therefore microphone will be able to measure not the incident field but rather the distorted field caused as a result of the presence of this microphone. So therefore it is imperative to make sure that the level of distortion is exceedingly small or sort of can be ignored in a real application situation and that happens when the microphone dimensions are much smaller compared to the wavelength of the sound that you are measuring. So again from the calculation of the frequency range of interest you should be able to find out what is the wavelength of the sound that is expected to be measured by this microphone and then uh, you should check that the dimensions are far smaller, dimensions of the microphone are far smaller than the dimensions of the wavelength of sound. Okay? Uh, and uh, the other way in which it affects is that, so in some sense smaller is better in terms of the scattering effect, but larger is better in terms of the sensitivity effect. So that is interesting, that is what th these are the two sort of count, uh, uh, competing factors which influence the design of the microphone itself. And as I said, at least for free field microphones, they are designed to work best or they are sort of calibrated to work under the situation where the acoustic pressure is normally incident onto the surface of the microphone, the diaphragm as we will call it. So uh, it so happens and as I illustrated schematically at least in the previous talk, if the direction of the incident wave is not normal, then it can cause uh, changes in the, uh, uh, in the response, in the mechanical response of this uh, diaphragm structure on the microphone and as a result it can lead to uh, difference in the sensitivity uh, of the microphone. So directivity of such free field microphones is going to be very important and typically uh, the manufacturer will also report this in his calibration, uh, in his uh, literature that uh, what is the variation of this sensitivity if this microphone is used for various, uh, for measurement which is uh, uh, such that the incident acoustic wave is not completely at 90 degree but at a direction. But then as I said that it is recommended that you use the microphone in the incident no direction itself, in the, in the direction normal to the incident wave 
but sometimes the problem is you may not have a very accurate estimate of this direction. So, you would like to know that what are the range of possible errors that you will make in case you go off. So, you would typically like to have this uh, sensitivity change within certain bounds. So, that is what will get reported, but please understand that this issue is there with free field microphone that it has a directivity and it is recommended that it will work best only if it is facing <coughs> the acoustic wave in a normal fashion. Okay. This issue is not there in pressure field microphone because anyway we understand that the pressure field microphone is supposed to work in a sort of omnidirectional fashion. We are saying that if we are interested to measure sound in a small enclosure where like let us say within a resonator, in such a case we are expecting that anyway across the entire points of interest the pressure field does not change by much in which case it really does not matter. Okay. <coughs> so, let us now look at how. Uh, Yeah, it's called sensitivity. Okay, gain in your gain control system uh, terminology. Yeah. Even if it is not that, you will still be able to interpret what is our original signal. You will be inter able to interpret only if it is a single frequency. If it is a multi-frequency combination, you will lose the interpretation, right? Even then, the frequency of the output signal will still yeah, be. Yeah, yeah. If it frequency. is if it is a single frequency input, then you will get a single frequency output. I think I understood your question. So, the point is this that even if see even if this sensitivity is not flat what will happen is that when you have only this uh, I think I will redo in the next page. If you have a single frequency input you will always have a single frequency output right. So, this is irrespective of the sensitivity right, but if you have a combination of two frequencies let us say these two frequencies are of equal amplitude. You would expect the corresponding voltages also to be of equal amplitude only then they will combine in the right fashion, right. If it so happens that despite these two frequencies input frequencies being at the same amplitude the output here is sort of undermined, right. Then in when you look at the voltage signal in your oscilloscope you will see that the high frequency is not so important, low frequency is more important. So, that is what will sort of contradict your actual, this is the input is actual, right, the reality. The output is what you will see, right. Typically, you are interested in a source where there are multiple frequencies, right. Otherwise, if it is just a single frequency measurement, it really does not matter as you uh, uh, said. But you will not be interested to buy a microphone to measure only 500 hertz sound, right, or 1 kilohertz sound. We can still back interpret it, though. say if we know what is the gain function, then we again we can, uh, the voltage output that we get. No, but see there is, a, the way it works is that you put a calibration factor, right. This whatever is this millivolt per Pascal, this value that is a single value, that calibration value is a single value. So, therefore, each of them will be interpreted, I mean you just convert, so whatever is the millivolt value here, you just convert this back to the Pascal value using a single value, that is the way it works. And the other issue that I did not mention in this talk is that of phase also. See, the if the phase here is going to change, then also it may cause and add let uh, addition or subtraction. Let us say this is sin omega t, sin omega 1 t and this is sin omega 2 t, right. Sorry, sin omega 1 t. So, the phase has not changed and this one was sin omega 1 t and this has now become cos omega 2 t. Sorry, this is 2, right. So, this will now be a sin and cos combination right. The sin plus cos combination is not going to give you a sin plus sin combination. The amplitudes again will change, the RMS also will change, right. So, the phase distortion also between the two frequencies should not be there, that is called phase distortion. So, the microphone also distorts the phase? Any general transducer can be treated as a gain function as you said. So, that gain function should be flat 
without any phase distortion. Okay. In that case, the calibration is very easy. Right. See, another question that will come is that of calibration, which we will touch upon briefly. When we calibrate a microphone, we calibrate for, not for all frequencies. We can calibrate, mostly we will calibrate for just one frequency. Right. We cannot calibrate once for omega 1, once for omega 2 and so on and so forth. What you are saying that instead of calibrating for a single number, you calibrate for the graph. But that requires you microphone for every measurement you need to recalibrate. The sensitivity chart which is reported is just like a benchmark which is there at its nascent stage. right? But usually in operation, you will have a calibrator which will calibrate this sensitivity value at the start of the experiment. And this is going to be a single value. So, unless you are sure that the frequency response is flat, there is no point in doing that calibration. Or you have to do calibration across at least all the octave bands, which will go be a very tedious process. All right. But yes, in, in principle, you can think that the calibration can be done in terms of a graph also. But that will make things pretty much complicated in actual uh, working out. In actual execution of the experiment, you will require calibration across all frequencies. Okay. <coughs> okay, now let us look at the condenser microphone. Uh, what you see in the top are pictures taken from the Bruel and Care website. These are how a condenser microphone looks like. Possibly these are not of the same thing that you would have looked when you uh, would have may used uh, a microphone for singing a song or what you have regularly see. The microphone that you are seeing uh, in my collar right now is not of this uh, kind. It is, it is a condenser microphone exclusively designed for measurement applications. We will come to the, those uh, uh, performance uh, microphones which are used by singers in a uh, little while. But this is how it looks uh, at least from the outside. Okay. And they come in all different sizes. Uh, I mean, it is like 1 by 8 inch, 1 by 4 inch. These are the typical sizes uh, of these microphones. Now, internally, this is how it looks like and this is just a schematic diagram which I have drawn uh, myself. So, this is how schematically the microphone looks from the inside. This surface here uh, is basically the diaphragm, right? What, and this is the surface which faces the acoustic waves. So the acoustic waves are incident on this diaphragm surface, and there's a housing which is pretty rigid, which uh, sort of on which this diaphragm is mounted, and then uh, there is a back plate here. So, this is all this part is also rigid. So, what happens is that between the diaphragm and this black plate, there is a capacitor that is at work, right. And you know the capacitor basically works on the principle that it has to be charged because uh, the I mean the uh, charge capacitance and the voltage across the two plates are related by the formula, which is of the kind Q equals to C V, right. So, in that case, uh, what we have is that the capacitance in itself depends upon the distance between the diaphragm and the back plate. Right? So, the, there is a parallel plate capacitor which is formed between the diaphragm and the back plate and the capacitance itself depends upon the distance of separation between the diaphragm and the back plate. What happens when the acoustic pressure is incident on this diaphragm is that the diaphragm will start vibrating. And when it starts vibrating, the distance of separation between the back plate and the diaphragm will change. So, if the distance changes, the capacitance changes, and if the capacitance changes, then and provided the charge is kept fixed, the voltage ac measured across these two phases will change. Right? And if you can therefore pick up the voltage change, you can calibrate this voltage change to the change in separation distance between these two parallel plates and that in turn can be calibrated to read off what is the acoustic pressure which has caused this change in distance. So, that is basically the principle in which this transducer will work. We will do the detailed calculations shortly also, but let us understand a few more important things. 
The first thing is that this diaphragm should not have a static deflection. In the static condition, it should have a certain profile which, which obviously should be like plain and simple uh, planar profile, right. You can expect that the deflected profile will not remain planar, it will deflect somewhat like a sinusoid. So, it is uh, you could not possibly construct this diaphragm within a vacuum filled cavity. Had it been vacuum cavity on one side, then it would have deflected under atmospheric pressure, right. So, therefore, you need a uh, atmospheric pressure to be existent on both the sides of the diaphragm such that the static deflection is 0 of this of this mechanical structure called the diaphragm. So, to ensure that the static pressure is 0, we should not have this cavity in vacuum, rather it, this cavity should have atmospheric pressure. So, towards that end there is a hole which is there and obviously, this is just a schematic description of the hole, this is not actually how the physical hole is there, right. So, depending upon the manufacturer there will be variants, but at least schematically we should understand that there is means by which atmospheric pressure is maintained on both sides of the diaphragm. On the outer side nothing needs to be done, it is always atmospheric pressure. On the interior side you must have this atmospheric pressure created and or the static pressure equalization done and that is done with some sort of a hole. As I said the displacement here of the diaphragm once it is excited, once any acoustic pressure wave is incident onto this diaphragm structure, the acoustic pressure wave is a dynamic loading. It is like a pressure loading which acts on this mechanical structure which is diaphragm and you can easily calculate at, uh, the how much is the displacement of this diaphragm due to that pressure loading either using simplistic vibration theories of lump model or if you think you can even employ finite element method type simulations, but usually finite element methods are not required because the remember we are talking about a situation where the structure is much small, com small compared with the wavelength of the sound. So, basically since the structure is small, the lump parameter approximation theory works pretty much well for this sort of a structure and that is what we are going to take up in the next few slides. So, we are actually going to find the displacement change due to the pressure loading that is actually incident onto the structure and then we are going to say how this displacement change causes a change in capacitance and then finally, how this capacitance change causes a change in voltage. Right. So, that is how things will work. So, capacitance change will be sensed as voltage change and as we will see, we will actually find out the sensitivity associated with this condenser microphone. We will see that the sensitivity will remain flat only below the first natural frequency of this structure, below the fundamental frequency of this structure. Right. Once you are approaching the frequency which is uh, near about, I would say like half of the diaphragm natural frequency, then you are surely going to see that the sensitivity will get distorted. It will no longer be flat, it will pick up and then if, even if you cross the resonance, you will no longer get a flat response and that will what uh, sort of uh, <coughs> distort the sensitivity. Okay. So, let us look at the electrical circuit now. As I said to measure, uh, to measure this uh, capacitance change, it has to be polarized. You, have, you must have a DC source which puts up an initial voltage towards this parallel plate capacitor because if you do not have any initial voltage, there is no charge. So, it does not work like a capacitor. If there is no voltage, there is no current or charge that will be coming out. So, to make this work, you need to have some source of polarization. Sometimes it is an external polarized source, sometimes uh, it could be like just a battery kind of thing, Some, uh, sometimes like even in collar mics, the way sometimes it can happen is that these, uh, these are called electret type microphones, wherein right at the time of manufacturing, they ensure that this charge between the two plates are residing, right. And that is what uh, happens in uh, other microphone classes, but let us stick with condenser microphones used for measurement. So, usually most of them would be <coughs> requiring 
a polarization voltage. So, this, this is the polarization voltage. So, polarization voltage could be again either a DC source or you can use your AC power supply and then rectify it and use an adapter which will basically ensure that initially before the wave is incident, I mean the starting condition of this transducer is that there is a residing voltage across the two plates of the capacitor that is the diaphragm and the back plate which essentially ensures that there is a charge equal and opposite charge residing on the two plates. Without that, the capacity, uh, these conditional microphones will not work by principle. And if you recall, the formula for the parallel plate capacitance is going to be something like this, epsilon s by x, right, or a, I should call this, a is the area. So, the capacitance between two parallel plate capacitor is given by this formula, A is the area of the parallel plates and x is the distance. Distance, right, and C is the capacitance. Epsilon is the permittivity of the medium. Okay, but since it is air, it, it can be found out very easily what is the value of this permittivity, right. So, let us understand two situations. One is the initial state. In the initial state, the acoustic pressure wave is not incident, pressure wave not incident onto the microphone. In other words, the acoustic source is not yet switched on, right, just you have polarized the system which means that initially between the diaphragm and the back plate, you are having a certain voltage, right you are having a certain voltage and uh, because of the electrical circuitry there is the way it is designed in fact there is a resistance also and these are the open terminals which are coming out from the transducer. So, basically voltage will be measured across this terminal so that you can change sense the change of capacitance and thereby sense the change in the distance between the two parallel plates. So, the distance between the two parallel plates is in initially denoted by D in my notation. So, the capacitance is epsilon A by D in the initial state and uh, in the measured while measuring this distance is going to change because the diaphragm is going to move in response to the applied acoustic pressure. So, while measuring the distance of, uh, sorry, not of, between the plates is going to change. By how much? By exactly the motion of the diaphragm. Back plate is supposed to be static. Back plate is not moving. Back plate is static. So, we are going to assume that the diaphragm motion is x. So, this diaphragm is going to move by x, which means capacitance when the acoustic source is switched on is going to be epsilon a by d minus x, right. So, at the end of the day, what do we have combining these two conditions? The combining these two conditions, we have C0 into d is equals to c into d minus x, which means the capacitance when the microphone is actually measuring the incident sound is equal to the initial capacitance when the acoustic source was switched off divided by d minus x into d, right. So, that is precisely the formula that I have quoted. C is equals to C0. 1 minus x d. So, that part also can be done pretty easily. So, this in 
one more step could be written as C0 is equals to 1 minus x by d. I am just divided the numerator and denominator by d. Right? Now, note by design what we will have is that x will be much lesser than d. So, the initial separation that we will choose to keep is going to be much more than the expected order of movement of this uh, uh, diaphragm. There are quite a few reasons for that. One reason obviously is that you do not want this diaphragm to actually make a mechanical impact with the back plate. Right? In that case, the diaphragm will definitely suffer some catastrophic failure. And even otherwise, if you make it very close, the electrical field will get distorted and you know, because actually strictly speaking, the electrostatic force will be very high if these two parallel plate capacitors tend to come <coughs> very close together. Right? So, those complications will be there. So, <coughs> at this stage, it suffices for us to understand that the capacitance of this uh, um, <coughs> in the measure uh, in the state in which it is measuring is definitely given by this formula and x being the motion of this diaphragm is going to be much lesser than the initial separation between the diaphragm and the back plate, which is denoted by d. And as I said, this resistance in this circuit is going to be chosen very high, whereas the initial capacitance C0 is usually of the order of few picofarads. Okay. Uh, now, what we have is that U c, which is the voltage across the two parallel plate capacitors is going to be Q by c, the amount of charge which is residing in the two parallel plates divided by the uh, capacitance of the uh, parallel plate capacitors. And this is c. By c, we mean the capacitance when uh, it is, uh, when the uh, acoustic source is switched on. That means, there is a certain motion, but C can be related to the initial capacitance wherein the source has not yet been switched on using this formula. So, if we substitute that back, we get C equals to C 0 1 minus x by d. Right? And also applying the voltage loop here, the voltage that you see across these terminals is uh, denoted as U. This is U C, the voltage between the diaphragm and the rigid uh, electrode is U C and the DC source is U0. So, this U is UC, uh, sorry, U0 minus UC. So, UC and U give, gives one loop and U0 gives another loop. So, U0 in other words, this uh, uh, change in potential is compensated by UC plus U. U is the potential between these two points in the uh, circuit. So, this is just the voltage equation in the circuit. Okay. Now, comes an important aspect that if the frequency is 1 by R C 0 is greater than the electric folding frequency. 1 by R C 0 is called the folding frequency of the electrical circuit and we will derive this also in a little more details, but the point is this. Uh, you can take this as an assumption now, but we will as I said, I will uh, probably make this even more clear in the next talk that if we have this condition omega is greater than uh, uh, 1 by R C 0, what is going to happen is that this part of the actually the effect of the resistance as I said resistance is very high. So, that means if the resistance is high here the charges sitting down here will find no incentive to go around this part. So, no current will actually flow in this parallel path, it will wait here. So, basically there is no flow of charge, the parallel plate capacitor itself just has accumulated certain amount of charge, but the charge is not in uh, 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 favorable to flow because of the high impedance associated with this high value of the resistance in this circuit. So, therefore, the electric charge whatever was the charge in the initial state when the acoustic source was actually switched off, that charge is remaining constant. This is the essential implication of this 
assumption if you may so call it for now, but as I said in the next class I am going to do away with this assumption and actually present you the sensitivity in a more detailed fashion, right. But for now you have to take it as this way in a sort of intuitive fashion that the resistance is high, if the resistance is high then you must have no charge leaking into this path. So, therefore, there is no other way, but the charge will remain frozen in this circuitry, right. So, whatever is the charge in between the two capacitors initially that remains constant, even when the capacitance changes the charge does not change is going to be our assumption for this simplified analysis. We will redo this analysis with without this uh, simplification also in the next class. Okay. So, what we have as a result is Q u c we had already de derived as q by c 0 1 minus x by d with this assumption we now can replace q to be q 0 and q 0 by c 0 is u 0 right because that is the initial condition at the initial state you had just an initial voltage u 0 an initial charge q 0 and an initial capacitance q c 0. c 0 by the way is not the same as c because the distance does matter. So, q 0 by c 0 is u 0 and 1 minus x d remains, right. So, if u c is u 0 1 minus x d and you also had u equals to u 0 minus u c using these two relation, you can say the voltage across these two terminals is u 0 x by d. In other words, if you measure the voltage across these terminals, you are essentially measuring the displacement of the diaphragm, right. So, that was the key feature. So, if you measure the voltage that can be mapped to the uh, displacement of this diaphragm, u0, u0 being the initial polarization voltage again that is going to remain constant irrespective of what is the sound that is incident onto this microphone set. And similarly, d is a constant which is the initial separation between the two black plate, uh, between the two plates, the diaphragm and the uh, back plate. So, therefore, this is the manner in which you can actually calibrate this output voltage to the response of the diaphragm, right. So, the voltage u is uh, proportional to the uh, motion of the diaphragm which is denoted by x, but then the motion of the diaphragm is also proportional to the incident acoustic pressure. This part is simpler to us because as mechanical engineers, we understand how the motion is related to the incident acoustic pressure. The circuitry probably is going to take us uh, uh, a little uh, I would say it is not very comfortable for us to appreciate, but hopefully it is clear which is why I did it slowly, but hopefully it is clear that the uh, voltage is proportional to the motion of the diaphragm. The motion of the diaphragm and the incident acoustic pressure the way it is related is no big deal, because we understand that the motion of the diaphragm if we look at the diaphragm as just a spring mass system, it will have a certain uh, motion it will have a certain force that is incumbent on it. So, if I just quickly redo this analysis. So, this is the diaphragm and the diaphragm is getting an excitation in the form of pressure. The total force that is acting on the diaphragm is P times A. Essentially, the diaphragm is lumped as a spring mass system with mass m and the compliance being or the stiffness being k and obviously, there is going to be some damping also. So, we already know that the transfer function relating the motion of this system with the incident uh, uh, with the loading is given by this form. I 2 zeta omega by omega n. This is from vibration theory, right. I do not want to derive this part of the result, but this is how we are going to, we know that the motion of the spring mass system is going to be related to its static deflection. The static deflection of this system is just going to be a f by k and the transfer function here which is called the dynamic magnification factor is given in this sort. So, in the following we just use a notation where we say eta is 2 zeta, 
right. So, with that we are going to get uh, this as our denominator and see p into a is basically going to be our force right. The force is p times a. So, u was u 0 x by d and x is p a by k divided by this denominator as we have just said. So, the key factor as I said is sensitivity which is the voltage divided by the incident pressure. So, the voltage divided by incident pressure comes out as this form and what you see here is for a fixed value of u 0 a and k and d all these are design parameters associated with the microphone. The only thing that will change the sensitivity is this frequency ratio. The ratio of the operating frequency to the mechanical resonance frequency of the structure, the first fundamental frequency because this is just a lumped system model, it will only give the first frequency or the fundamental frequency. So, the fundamental frequency, this ratio of the actual operating frequency to the fundamental frequency dictates the sensitivity together with this eta factor, which is basically mapping the damping ratio zeta, but it is exactly not zeta, it is twice of zeta, right. So, if I plot this graph, this is how it looks like. As I said, it is very, very flat starting from, this is a logarithmic graph, I must say that starting from 0 onwards, it remains flat, it peaks up at 10 to the power 0, which is 1. So, at 1, that means when the frequency, operating frequency matches the mechanical resonance frequency of the diaphragm, the flatness of the sensitivity graph is lost and also the phase undergoes a sharp change. From at resonance, the phase undergoes a sharp change from 0 to 180 degree, right. Uh, if you look back at your vibration theory. So, here you should, uh, the, uh, the key point to appreciate is that you should not work with this microphone beyond about this range. Till about here, we see it is reasonably flat, we could make use of this microphone. But once this sensitivity start chart shows a uh, behavior where it, it climbs up and then again it falls down. So, it is not that you know excepting for this frequency we can use it. So, never again it comes back flat, right. So, that is the part that we wish to avoid. So, we will by this analysis what is shown is that the operating frequency of the microphone should strictly be below the mechanical resonance frequency of the diaphragm of your condenser microphone. Right. In the next class, we will see how that, that electrical folding frequency comes up. Today, we have just taken that as an assumption, but hopefully in the next class, we will prove it and establish that uh, there is a lower limit also, which dictates the flatness of this sensitivity response. So, as I said, the sensitivity of the microphone is determined by the mechanical displacement response function, which is basically this denominator factor. What we see here is that if the microphone size goes up, the mass will go up. If the mass goes up, resonance frequency will come down. If the resonance frequency will come down, then the use, usable frequency range will decrease, right? Because omega by omega n is what matters. You should not cross omega by omega n to the extent of 0.3 or something like that. You should not approach near about 1. Even 0.5 is looking bad. So, maybe 0.3 which is around here is okay, okay? Or better still stay at 1 by 10. Right. So, that, that is what uh, the guideline we extracted in today's class. So, we will pick it up from here, we will do a more accurate sensitivity analysis in the next class. Thank you.